Well, live from Jackie Robinson Ballpark in beautiful downtown Daytona Beach, Florida. It's time for another series of Southwestern Athletic Conference baseball action on Cat Eye Network Radio. It's the Bethune Cookman Wildcats, 15 and 13 and 7 and 1 in conference play. Welcoming in the Jackson State Tigers, 20 and 8. They've started SWAC play five and three. Hello and a very warm welcome. My name is Michael Trevillo. Happy to have your company. Once again, Bryce Wynoski joins me here at the broadcast desk. Bryce, it feels like it's been a while since you and I have uh, done one of these uh, organizational upheaval and illness and all of that. And uh, we're finally back to where we don't move belong. And it's 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 good to be back. You know, we had a, a, a little doubleheader action, softball, baseball, going into action the same weekend at home. We had, you know, everybody dealing with a little bit of hiccups as as we do throughout a long baseball season, long spring season in general. But it's good to be back, and it's a good one tonight, a good series this weekend for the Wildcats. This Jackson State team last year was one the Wildcats dealt with pretty handily when they needed to. The series overall was 3-3 three and three in six contests, but the Wildcats, did win two walk-offs, one to clinch the number two seed of the playoffs and another one to eliminate Jackson State from the playoffs. And with that, the the three and three split in that regular season, both teams took care of business at home. You won the series at your home venue and you lost the series on the road. Well, now's the time where you take care of business at your home stadium. You know, the Wildcats have been home for, for quite a bit now, so you don't want to get complacent at the end of a long home series with a big road stretch coming up pretty soon. So this is the type of team you need to take care of business of. You need to do your thing at home. It'll be Jordan McClady, the right fielder leading off for Jackson State. He's getting ready to stand in to the left-handed batter's box to face another player who's been dealing with some illness. It's not just the broadcasters um, and staff that have been under the weather. Tanner Bocabello missed his last start over the weekend against Alabama A&M, but the last time we did see him on the mound, he threw a complete game shutout against Florida State, and the righty deals. Ground ball up the middle, fielded by Cordova at short, and there's one away on one pitch. That is the recipe for another long outing. Of course, it's way too early to call it anything similar like we saw last weekend, but working to contact is what Tanner Bocabello has had his most success this season. Perfect game, Swack, preseason pitcher of the year. Here's the center fielder, Rodney Hibbler. I didn't even get to get to Jordan McClady's numbers. He was in and out of the batter's box so fast. Hibbler is a senior batting 351, and the first pitch to him right at a righty is lined into right field, and there's a base hit. So two pitches, two swings, one out, and one base hit for Jackson State, and there's a lot of inflated offensive numbers for this Jackson State team. 373, 351, 388, 361. This is a very good team at the bat. And not to mention that gargantuan the advantage they have on the base pass. They're the top team in the SWAC at that number. We may see some steals early. They're a very athletic team and clearly one that's going to be aggressive at the plate and on the base pass. Here's Lenny Montesano spinning a throwback to first to try and pick off Hibbler. Hibbler is the top base stealer on this Jackson State team. 20 steals on 23 attempts. They'll throw over again. Montesano a junior batting 316. In 98 at-bats, he scored 20 runs on 31 hits, 9 doubles, a triple, 4 homers, and 25 RBIs. Pitch, breaking ball, hammer to left field and deep. Back goes Chun to the track, to the wall. It is off the wall and gone. It's a home run. Fifth of the season for Lenny Montesano, and it's 2-0 Jackson State. Will the Wildcats continue? Their trend of giving up runs at the top of the first. And now there is some consternation because Coach Hernandez thinks it would be a ground rule double. So the Wildcats outfield and into the infield, obviously Garrett Chun's the guy who's closest to that ball, was pretty adamant in holding their hands up as you would when there's a ground rule double. It's a signal for when it bounces over the wall. I, it, it's hard to see both the combination of the shadows from the sun from where we're at and maybe even from where Chun and everybody's at to see, maybe if it bounced off the wall. But in that case, you would still think it would be a home run, but we've seen similar things at this ballpark as of late. And now they're going to put the runners on first and third. We'll see now. I'm not sure why that is. That seems like the only outcome we couldn't have because of not crazy. If it's a ground rule double, double we should <laughs> be on second, and then the runner comes home. There's no scenario unless... 
maybe it wedged itself somewhere in the wall that we couldn't see. Again, I, I'm basically operating on the assumption that they saw something that we didn't at this point because how else could we end up with a result like this? Head coach for the Tigers, Omar Johnson, is out arguing. Now, it is a ground rule double, so it'll be at second and third with one out. We've had some strange, strange calls lately. Well, here's the top hitter for Jackson State, Joseph Eichelberger, a junior batting 388, 29 runs on 40 hits, three doubles, one triple, two homers, and 33 RBIs. And the first pitch that isn't hit into play is a ball, and it's 1-0. Second and third, one down, grounded to third, and going to first with the ball is Gonzalez Fabo. He gets the out and does a good job at holding Hibbler on third, so now there's two away. That was a very wise play by Gonzalez Febo to keep the runner cemented over there. Did a little more than kind of looked him back, made a queer a quick step over towards him at third, but still had the arm strength to fire over to first and get the out. It's an interesting defensive lineup in the fact that Gonzalez Febo's at third, Figueroa remains in center. And here is Robert Tate Jr. First pitch to him, fastball to strike one. Tate, a freshman, batting 361. 16 runs on 22 hits, one double and 11 RBIs. And he's got runners on second and third with two down. And Bocabello deals. Breaking ball, chop toward third. It's going to be into the glove of Cordova. Long throw to first. It is in time. What a play by Ramsey's Cordova. A leaping Derek Jeter-esque throw across the diamond. And the Wildcats don't allow a run. No runs. Two hits, two left. And we go to the bottom of the first. Jackson State, nothing. Wildcats coming to bat. This is Bethune Cookman University Baseball on Cat Eye Network Radio. We go to the bottom of the first scoreless here at the Jack between the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats and the Jackson State Tigers. Daniel Figueroa digs in, and he'll face the starting pitcher, the senior left-hander Garrett Vandeventer. Vandeventer is 3-2, and two, with a 25 ERA. He's a lefty that uses a sidearm delivery. And Figueroa, who's been batting in the nine hole the last couple of games, will get the leadoff spot as the Wildcats continue to shuffle their lineup around Bryce. We've seen, taking Wednesday, where a bunch of the reserves played against Florida State out of the equation, we've seen the lineup be shuffled around a lot in the last week or so. Still trying to find that that perfect mixture. And, and Figueroa is a guy that, Again, I, I know we've talked about a handful of times. They want to see near the top of the lineup. This is a guy they've been trying to put First in First pitch spot. to him, lays down a bunt foul, third base side. And it's so and one Figueroa, a two fifty nine hitter. In 54 at bats, he has 12 runs on 14 hits, two, two doubles and four RBIs on base of 385. 
it'll be interesting to see how he handles the pressure of that leadoff spot because you know it's easy to say like oh what does it matter where you hit but it, it's certainly a factor in baseball games for guys breaking ball hit foul first base side so it's zero and two Rest of Vandeventer's numbers, he's got nine appearances with seven starts in 44 and two-thirds innings pitch. He's given up 34 runs on 48 hits, 31 of those earned. Striking out 35 and walking 20 with an opponent batting average of 276. And his 0-2 is way outside, and it's 1-2. The catcher, Sebastian Cabeza, set up outside and it went even further into the opposite batter's box here's the one two inside and it hit figueroa and he'll take that free pass working that leadoff spot is all about getting on base whatever means necessary you get a little bit of a gift there but it'll be interesting to see over the course of the yeah. night how he adapts to that leadoff spot after a little bit of time away from it yeah. van deventer has been a bit wild this season that is his fifth hit batter he also has two wild pitches on the year but I wouldn't be surprised if we see Figueroa try and steal here as Garrett Chun stands in. That is something that hasn't changed as Garrett Chun in that two-hole. Been there all season long and been one of the Wildcats' best hitters. He's batting 252, 15 runs on 29 hits, three doubles, a triple, and a team-high 24 ribbies. And the first pitch to him is a ball low. And it's 1-0. Wildcats in the powder blue Alternate strip tonight. It's been the Friday regulars all season. The 1-0. There's a strike at the knees, and it's 1-1. One one. Jackson State Navy helmets, Navy hats, excuse me, Navy jerseys with a light blue and white stripe on the sleeve and gray pants. A lot of, a lot of pullover jerseys in the swag. This is one of them. This one's lined in the left field. That's going to drop in for a base hit. Garrett Chun. Continues to stay hot. There's two on with nobody out for the Cats. And credit to Chun. He hasn't always been as, you know, fiery hot as we saw him in the first couple weeks of the season. But he's easily been the most consistent guy day in and day out. Defensively, always excellent. Now, and at the plate, he's just Lillard been a steady presence. I remember the Sunday game against Lillard. Alabama a and He saved a couple of runs with a leaping catch out in left field with the Bulldogs having multiple runners on. Has really been the one guy that no matter what you can you can lock him in in that left field and top of the order bat. Here's Sergio Rivera, second and first, nobody outs. First pitch from Vandeventer squares to bunt and chops it foul behind the plate, and it's 0-1. Rivera, a junior batting 312, second best on the team, actually third best on the team. In 112 at bats, he's got 23 runs on 35 hits, eight doubles, two triples, and 15 ribbies. The 0-1 squares to bunt, and he pulls back, takes the ball outside, 1-1. One and one. So the idea from Coach Hernandez is clear. Get on, get over, get in by any means necessary, even having one of your better power hitters bunt. They've been a refreshing bit of small ball type team early in the season. Fun one to watch because you never really know how they're going to approach another base bat. The 1-1, he pulls back a bunt again, takes a pitch high upstairs by his shoulders. And it's 2-1. Van Deventer's walk to strikeout ratio looks pretty good. 35 strikeouts to 20 walks. Two one. Squares to bunt. Corners rush in. He pulls it back, takes his strike, and it's two and two. What you really want to avoid here is grounding into a double play. And the second baseman, White, will now go to that turn or double play depth. The shortstop. Tate is playing close to second base. So there's a big gap in between the third baseman who's playing close to the line and the shortstop if he can pull it. Here's the 2-2. Two -two. Pulls it back. Runner goes down to third. Here's the throw. Safe as Figueroa steals a base. Markets have not shied away from the steal of third early on in the season. We've seen plenty of times going steal a second and then steal a third, but that's a great way to get out of a little bit of force out territory and really set up now that dreaded double steal now here's the wind picking up at the jack it is blowing hard left to right out of the west it's a full count delivery to sergio rivera here's the pitch ground ball towards third through the gap and in there for a base hit coming home is figueroa he'll walk in to score and it's one nothing bethune cookman what did i say where the gap was it was right between shortstop and third and that's where rivera put it 
And that was despite the Wildcats threatening a little bit with that double steal there. It's been interesting to watch when they've pulled that one out. I'm surprised to see Chun go for second there with no outs in the inning, but that's a credit to Sergio Rivera to be able to put the Cats in front regardless. So it's one nothing Bethune Cookman, and for the first time in quite a while, the Cats have an early lead. And that'll bring up Jorge Gonzalez. Still no outs in the inning, first and second for the Wildcats. And the first pitch, breaking ball, hammered back up the middle. There's a base hit. Rounding third and coming home is Chun. The throw to the plate is wild and offline, and Chun is home standing up. 2 nothing Bethune Cookman. And it's such a welcome start for a Wildcats team that all weekend last weekend lived behind. Every time came up to bat, even as soon as the bottom of the first in every game, trailing, 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 come out firing, jump in front early, and now hold on. Uh, I didn't get to Gonzalez's numbers because he swung at the first pitch, and here's Irvin Escobar, someone who wants to play more baseball, I'm sure. He's been platooning at that catcher spot all season long. He's a 354 hitter, which is tops in the lineup today. Here's the pitch. He squares to bunt, pulls it back, ball outside, 1-0. and In 48 at-bats, he's got eight runs on 17 hits, a double and 10 RBIs. And Irvin's just one of those guys that goes to work every day and doesn't let what happened in the past affect him. He squares to bunt again, pulls it back, takes a slider strike outside corner, 1-1. One and one. He has had maybe the biggest miss of the season. He came up to bat. With two outs and the bases loaded, the Cats down by one against USF and struck out to end the game. Here's the 1-1. One, one. It won't be a pitch as Van Deventer spins and throws it back to second. Rivera's on second. Gonzalez is on first. The first four Wildcats have reached base and two have come in already. And it's 2 nothing Cats. No outs. Bottom of the first. Escobar squares to bunt. He lays it down third base side. Charging is Montesano. He throws it. Oh, what a diving catch by the first baseman, Standifer. But because he had to dive, Rivera is able to tag and score all the way from second. And it's 3 nothing Bethune Cookman. These Wildcats are such a heads up base running team. And I, I don't think that's by des I don't think that's by coincidence. You know, we've seen Coach Hernandez take over that spot as a third base coach, waving Rivera home, making sure to push the pace at all times. They've been not only aggressive, but they've been smart. I, I want to recap that one because Escobar bunted it down the third base line. Montesano charged, threw to first. It was offline. It was a great job by Standifer to stretch and lay out for the catch and keep his foot on the base. Here's the pitch to Manny Soufrane, low and outside ball one. But because Standifer had to basically fall down to keep his foot on the bag, it allowed Rivera to come all the way home. And now with the runner on second, one down here, Soufrane. He's looking at a 1-0 count. Here's the pitch from Vandeventer. And it's in there for a strike, one and one. Sue Frain on the season, batting 247. 20 runs on 18 hits, a team second place, eight, or sorry, seven doubles, one triple, one homer, 13 RBIs, and a team leading 27 walks. Breaking ball hit towards second base and past the diving glove of White and into right field. Coming all the way home from second is Gonzalez. The throw is cut off. It is 4 nothing Bethune Cookman. And it's been a healthy dose of breaking balls from Van Devender early in this game. And it's kind of got that curve that you watch it early. You might pick some corners with it, but it's one that if it falls over the middle, is so easily taken advantage of. And the Wildcats have so consistently all these hits coming off of that breaking ball. And now we will get a meeting on the mound. There's nobody warming up in the bullpen for Jackson State, so I don't think there's going to be a pitching change. But that gives us a chance to talk about Jorge gonzalez Fabo, who is coming up next. And there is maybe nobody on this team that needs to string a couple of good games together more than Jorge. And he's a polarizing kind of hitter because he's, a, in many ways, that modern baseball hitter. He's always swinging for balls in the gap, trying to get under, put air underneath the ball. And it just hasn't worked out for him early in the season. I, I don't know how much we credit that to the couple of home runs in his first couple of bats as a, a division one baseball player if that put a little bit too much of that mentality into him I know there's been conversations between coach Hernandez coach Cartaya and Gonzalez Febo but he he just hasn't done anything to earn a consistent spot in this day-to-day -day lineup and he's a guy that they obviously want there a freshman who got hit in the cleanup spot on opening day he, he's a guy they want there but he hasn't been able to kind of put it all together yet yeah he leads the team in strikeouts 
per nine with 19 strikeouts and only 73 at-bats. He does have those two home runs hit in the first two series of the season. He sees a breaking ball from Van Deventer, and it's 1-0 and with a bit misses low. There is a Jackson State pitcher warming up in the right field bullpen. Here in the bottom of the first with one out, 4 nothing already. Bethune-Cookman, breaking ball, catches the outside corner for strike one. It's been all slider and curveball. I don't think Van Devender's thrown a fastball. I think we may have seen a couple of them, but it's, a pitch like that doesn't hurt you because there's not a whole lot you can do with it if you do make contact, but it's when it finds the zone. The 1-1 one -one popped sky high down the first baseline, racing over the right fielder. McCloudy, he can't make the play as it bounces in foul territory. So it'll be 1-2 and two on Fabo. He gets another hack at it. But again, that's the kind of swing you were talking about, Bryce, just trying to take the cover off the ball when really what's been serving the Wildcats well in this first inning is just taking what the pitcher gives you, getting line drive and ground ball singles through the gap. And Van Deventer's problem to this point is he's not missing bats. Guys are making contact with just about everything that they've decided to go after. When you work mostly off speed like that, there has to be some deception involved, and he doesn't have the power, he doesn't have the spin to do any of that to this point. The senior from Arkansas City, Kansas, deals. And a breaking ball outside. Good layoff from Febo. And it's two and two. Manny Soufrain is on first base with one out and four already in in the inning for Bethune-Cookman. Here's the two-two. Breaking ball misses away. That's a sinker. First time I've seen that from Van Deventer. It just drops away right in front of the plate, but it was well outside. The count runs full to Febo. Here's the payoff. Fable swings and misses. Strike three. Soufrain goes to second. And he's out. It's a strike him out. Throw him out. Double play. And Jackson State gets out of the first. But still, four runs, five hits, and nobody left. And we go to the second inning of play. It's 4 nothing Bethune Cookman over Jackson State right here on Cat Eye Network Radio. We go to the top of the second. Wildcats have a 4 nothing lead. Well, we were talking in the break, Bryce, and you, you got to remember that Tanner Bocabello got hit pretty hard in that top of the first, and the Tigers are unlucky to really not have two runs on the board right now. Bocabello's first pitch is outside to the lefty Miles White, who is the only returning player from last year in this starting lineup for Jackson State. White, a 304 hitter. Here's the pitch. And he takes a fastball strike outside corner, one and one. And 69 at bats. He's got 15 runs on 21 hits. Three doubles, two triples, 14 RBI. is slugging 406. The 1-1 one -one is a fastball strike on the outside corner. Exact same spot as the second pitch, one and two. It's the first batter I've seen Bocabello actually go at guys with the fastball. He's been primarily off speed to this point. Here's the one-two. Swing and a miss. Got him on the sword. Escobar drops the ball, throws to first for the out. Talk about deception when you're pitching. If you're getting a guy swinging at something that's nearly clipping his knees, you've done your job. Yeah. That's the first time I think we've seen Bocavello go for a pitch like that. It was just throw it as hard as you can in the dirt and hope you get a swing. And Miles White obliges one down. And I think the four runs the Wildcats scored in the first will settle Bocavello down a bit. 
And here's the first pitch. Swing and hit off the end of the bat to right field. Moving over Rivera. He makes the catch. Full sprint. Oh, no. Oh, he did make the catch. The umpire made a weird signal. <laughs> Rivera tried to pick something up on the ground. I don't know if we thought he dropped the ball. but No, he made the catch. But, I mean, that's, again, the sun is going down, and there's a big glare out in right field with the sun still hitting it. So, Rivera does make the play, and there's two outs for Hassan Standifer. First pitch. Check swing. Soft grounder towards short. Cordova across the diamond. In time. And Bocabello recovers after a rough first inning to get the Tigers 1-2-3. We go to the bottom of the second. 4 nothing Wildcats here on Cat Eye Network Radio. We go to the bottom of the second, 4 nothing Bethune-Cookman here at the Jack. Ramsey's Cordova, who's batting down to the eighth spot, dropped two from the sixth spot where he's been the last couple of weeks, leads off against Garrett Vandeventer in his first pitch. is a swing and a miss, fastball at the knees, and it's 0-1. Vandeventer threw 26 pitches in that first inning, gave up four runs on five hits. Breaking ball misses outside, and it's 1-1. One one. That first pitch, fastball, to Cordova was one of the few fastballs we've seen Vandeventer throw. He works quickly. Here's the 1-1. One, one. Breaking ball catches the outside corner. Cordova doesn't agree with it. It's 1-2. and two. Ramsey's a 288 hitter, 14 runs on 18 hits, a double, a homer, and 12 ribbies. Here's the 1-2. Check swing in the dirt. Did he go? No. And it's 2-2. Two two. This game holds all the makings of kind of how we felt going throughout the SWAC tournament last year. It's like, well, guys can't find the zone. We're going to get to the bullpen quickly, and we'll see if that person can find the zone. The 2-2. Two -two. Breaking ball hammered towards short, but right at Tate. He throws across, and there's one away. That's the first maybe simple put out Jackson State's had in the field. I would never get too comfortable if I'm the Jackson State okay. coaching staff with Van Deventer because it's another one that, although it's on the ground right at a defender, is still hit hard. That's not a missed bat, and that can easily translate into big innings like we saw already. And one down, and now here's another player who really needs to have a good series of play, Colton Olison. Breaking ball misses the zone, ball one. Colton missed a home run by a couple inches against UCF on Tuesday. Had the same ground rule, double ruling that we had a guy. He hits one in the air to center field, moving over Hibbler, and he makes the catch. It wasn't very deep. But again, Colton's making some good contact the last couple of games. Just hasn't found the ground. The ball we saw on Sunday was maybe up there with the hardest hit ball I've ever seen from him. No Figueroa. And now two down back to the top of the order for Daniel Figueroa. He was hit by a pitch and scored his first time up. Also stole a base. Curveball catches the outside corner for strike one. Our umpires today behind the plate, Don Andrews at first, Philip Blake, and at third, Landon Davis. The 0-1 is a ball outside, 1-1. One one. All those umpire names should be familiar to if you frequent our broadcasts. And 
the Jackson State bench has been warned by Andrews, the home plate umpire, about arguing balls and strikes. I, I definitely understand where they're coming from. I think especially that pitch low in the zone. They really want Van Deventer to get. But that's a quick way to get on the bad side of an official. And so you probably want to, especially at this point, keep, keep it down a little bit. Yeah, well, and you already know that Omar Johnson is not a big fan of this umpire and crew after, in his opinion, they took away a home run from Joseph Eichelberger in the first. Called it a ground rule double, not even a run score. The Wildcats, of course, came back in the bottom of the inning and played it four. So the count is one and one as Figueroa stands back in. And the pitch. That is hit hard to left center field. That is going to get down and hop towards the wall. Figueroa is going to race towards second. Here comes the throw. He slides in safe. And it's a double for Danny Figueroa. Seems that that little uh, stint in the nine hole, eight hole, down the bottom of the lineup did him well. Swinging the bat well, remaining patient well. Figueroa's got a chance here to really finally take that leadoff yeah. spot that he's been kind of flirting with all, all season long. And he didn't really commit that towards second base after he saw that ball bounce, but Eichelberger had left kind of bobbled it a little bit, and that allowed him to slide into second with a base hit. Here's Garrett John, who singled Figueroa home in his first at-bat, came around to score himself. First pitch to him, spin, and no throw back to second because nobody was covering the bag. So the three Wildcat hits in the first, not including Manny Suffrain, breaking ball, chop foul by Chun, and it's 0-1, were all opposite feet. Chun grounded one to the left, Rivera lined one to left, Gonzalez hit one to right. Correction, two out of those three were opposite field, Rivera's a right hand. Time as a ball escapes the Jackson State bullpen and rolls all the way behind home plate. A lot for the umpires to do early on in this one. Bullpen down there for Jackson State continues to work pretty quickly here. Van Deventer just not been impressive on the mound. 0-1 with two outs and a runner on second. Here's the pitch to Chun. He swings and flares it foul again into the bleachers on the left field line. And it's 0-2. The last two breaking balls from Van Deventer have finally shown a little bit of lateral movement. To this point, everything's mostly been vertical. You started seeing trail a little bit away from Chun into that left-handed, excuse me, that right-handed batter's box. That one outside as Cabeza sets up all the way in the outside batter's box. Chun doesn't swing, and it's one and two. Wildcats trying to add on to this 4 nothing lead. Figueroa at second with two down. And the pitch. Fouled away again. Three straight fouls into the grandstands on the left-hand side. He's gone to that breaking ball on four straight now. That same one that's tailing away from Chun in the bottom half of the zone. It's not a bad pitch. It's certainly one you can live with because that's the kind of contact you're going to get if he does swing at it. Once again, the 0-2 lefty to lefty and way outside. That time he went with the fastball and over-rotated on it. As I mentioned, Van Deventer's got kind of a sidearm delivery. Whips that ball out there from way away from his body. And here's the 2-2. Two -two. Low 3-2. and two. Van Deventer's pitch count already up to 36 here in inning number two. So probably not long for the pitcher's mound in this one. The 3-2 to Chun. Ground ball towards second. White bobbles it, but he comes up with it and fires safe. And coming home all the way in the confusion and scoring is Figueroa. He didn't stop. He tore around third and dove face first to home. And it's 5 nothing Bethune Cookman. And, and I think that play shows you a lot more than just maybe speed or smart base running. There's some fire we're seeing out of this Bethune Cookman dugout. And some that I don't think we saw a ton even last series that they sweep against Alabama and m Certainly not Tuesday night against UCF. But guys are. Are, are going for it. They're trying to get ahead. They're trying to pummel this Jackson State team, and it's good to see. So Chun gets an infield single and an RBI as Figueroa scores all the way from second. And now here's Sergio Rivera, first pitch in the dirt ball one. 
That was an interesting defensive play, right? Because the it was a slow roller towards White at short. He tried to barehand it. He ended up bobbling it. By the time he threw it over there, Chun was safe. It was very close. But the official was right there to make the call. Ground ball outside of third and foul. So we count one and one on Sergio Rivera, who singled in Chun and scored as well. His first time up. The Wildcats have played another, excuse me, played in another one. They lead five zip here in the second. And a 1-1, breaking ball outside two and one. You see Chun there even fake this deal over, just putting little pressure points on throughout the inning. Can't ever let off the gas. You can't make mistakes against this Wildcats team. They just take advantage. Seems like just about every time. That one's grounded hard or short. It's bobbled, but recovered by Tate, who flips to second to end the inning. Put the in the bottom of the second. One run, one hit, one error, and one left on. One run, one hit, one error, and one left. And we go to the third inning. It's now 5 nothing Cats here on the Cat Eye Network. We are back on Jack for Bethune Cookman baseball. We start the top of the third with the nine hole hitter, Letty Alvarez, for Jackson State. A sophomore batting 214. Wildcats have a 5 0 lead. Tanner Bocabello deals first pitch. Alvarez squared to bunt. The pitch is up by his face, and it's ball one. Alvarez once again batting 214. 11 runs on nine hits, three doubles, and two RBIs. Swings and misses at a fastball upstairs, and it's one and one. Alvarez, while he's hitting 214, is on base, is only 353. Breaking ball, check swing, no swing, and he misses outside two and one from Boca Bello. He's recovered nicely and has only thrown 13 pitches in the first two innings. After, I think, what was a six pitch inning number two? Fastball chopped towards short. Fielded by Cordova across the diamond in time. Ramsey's has got a lot of work. That's his third put out of the game already, and there's one down. And, and here's where you see the stark difference in Friday night, guys, for Bethune Cookman versus Jackson State. You've got a guy in Boca Bella that's walked five guys all season. He's going to, at the very least, be in and around the strike zone, which is so critical because if you can't find the strike zone, you run into four run innings and another one run inning after that. But just the, the mere fact that he's staying in the zone and being consistent is going to lead to a deep starts. Now we're back to the top of the order. Here is Jordan McLaddy, who grounded out to short his first time up. Boca Bello making his eighth appearance of the season tonight. Here's the pitch. It's low, and it's 2-0 and to McLaddy. He's batting 373. He was first pitch swinging on a ground out his first time up, so I never got to his numbers. He scored 37 runs on 41 hits as he swings and misses at a pitch inside 2-1. and one. With nine doubles, three triples, two homers, and 20 RBIs, he leads the team in slugging percentage with 564. Pitch. Breaking ball swing and a miss. It tailed away to the lefty. And it's 2-2. Two and two. Of course, Boca Bello missed his last scheduled start in the Alabama A&M series due to illness pitch. 
breaking ball, hammer towards short, diving stop by Fable, throws across the diamond, in time! What a play by Jorge Gonzalez Fable! That's a way to keep your bat in the lineup if it's not necessarily pulling its share of work from that side. If you're going to show that kind of effort, that kind of poise defensively, and even as a freshman, that is how you get on the good side of your coach and stay in that lineup. Full stretch dive to his non-glove side, squeezes it, and then pops up and throws across the diamond for the outs. And now there's two away, and here's Rodney Hibbler pitch. Fastball strike at the letters 0-1. Hib Hibbler singled his first time up and was moved to third on the ground rule double by Montesano, but eventually was stranded there. Bocabello working quickly. Here's the 0-1. Upstairs, one and one. Montesano batting 316. 20 runs on 31 hits. Nine doubles, a triple, four homers. Correction, this is Hibbler. He's batting 351. There's a strike. And it's one and two. And Bocabello, a strike away from getting another one, two, three inning here. And the righty deals. Fastball outside corner, and the frame job doesn't sell the home plate umpire on that one. And it's two and two. Tanner checks his pitch com and deals. Big breaking ball, flared foul, first base side. Count holds two and two. Correction, one and two. Nope, it is two and two. They have not put the second ball on the scoreboard yet. So once again, the two, two. A fastball upstairs and in, and the count runs full. Nope, it is pitch. Outside and low, and it's only the sixth walk of the season allowed by Boca Bello. And what have we said all year, Bryce? Two outs, getting out of innings. Wildcats have not been able to do it with any regularity this season. And now here is the man who almost hit the home run, Lenny Montesano, who almost crushed his fifth homer of the year back in the first. And he's in the exact same scenario with Hibbler on first. They check back to first. Remember, Hibbler is the top stealer on this team, 20 successful steals on 23 attempts. And the first pitch to Montesano, swing and a miss. Hibbler faked the steal and retreats back to first. Count 0 1 on Lenny. The junior from the Bronx, New York pitch. Swing and a miss. No. It Not fouled off. it off. Must have barely caught a piece of it. It was inside. And it was a check swing. Okay, just above the hands. So the count holds 0-2. And, and once again, Boca Bellows a strike away. Hibbler on first, two outs here in the third. And a spin and a throw back to first. Dufresne had to be wary. That throw was a little wild, but he does snag it. Don't want to give free bases on throwing errors on pickoff attempts. Especially with two outs. They go over to first again. We saw this a lot against Alabama A&M over the weekend. Any time there was somebody on base, the Wildcats would just incessantly check over there. They're just so used to being the ones to do it on the other side that they're just as careful. Pitch out. Throw back to first. Safe. And the count is one and two on Montesano. At this point, if you're Boca Bello, there's two strikes. I would just try and focus on getting Montesano out of there and getting out of the inning. He's lived on the inner half of the plate thus far. Here's the pitch. It goes over Montesano's head. Great reactions by Irvin Escobar behind the plate to snag it. The count is two and two. Boca Bello was up 0-2 in this count. Trying to nibble at the corners a little bit here. Pitch. 
Runner goes. Here's the throw down to second and safe. The tag was high as Colton Olison grabbed it and tried to throw his arm down to snag the stealing Hibbler. He slides in there safely. Coach Hernandez is going to come out to argue. The pitch was low, and it's 3-2 and two on Montesano. Shows you the arm speed of, of Escobar to be able to get that as close as it was. If that ball was thrown in a better position to apply the tag quicker, if it wasn't so high, that's easily an out. But because Olison had to go so far down, that's when you see the stolen base. And Coach Hernandez, after getting a nice chat in with the umpire Landon Davis, retreats the dugout, and it'll be a full count pitch upcoming to Lenny Montesano. Hibbler on second after walking and stealing a base. There are two outs in the inning after Alvarez and McClaney both grounded out. And a 3-2. Foul the way, we'll see another one. <laughs> that one somehow found a gap between the top of the netting and the roof. <laughs> it hit about four support beams before <laughs> finally hitting the ground. Don't always uh, keep your head on a swivel here. Once again, the full count delivery from Boca Bello. Ground ball slowly foul outside of first, and we'll do it again. This will be the eighth pitch of this at-bat to Letty Montesano. The transfer from Northwestern Oklahoma State at the Division II level. Bocabello checks his wrist, comes set at the waist, and spins and throws back to second, and the ball gets into center field as Colton Olison wasn't ready. Hibbler goes to third, and Jackson State now has a runner 90 feet away. And with, with two outs and a full count, that's, that's where you start to look at all the throwovers and just say, why, why is it necessary? I get you, you want to keep the guy honest over at second base, but you're just setting yourself up. It's it's going to happen eventually. You don't throw over that many times and not have it sail out. The 3-2 swing and a miss. And it doesn't matter because Montesano goes down swinging. No runs, no hits, one error, and one left. And we go to the bottom of the third. Still 5 nothing. Bethune-Cookman over Jackson State right here on the Cat Eye Network. After settling down a little bit in the second inning, Garrett Vanderventer remains on the hill before Jackson, Jackson State. State. And here's Jorge, so Jose, excuse me, Gonzalez. And the first pitch is a ball 1-0. and oh. Gonzalez singled to the right-hand side his first time up. And eventually came around to score. Pitch low, 2-0. He was the last of the four Wildcat runs in the bottom of the first as he was driven in by Manny Suffrain. Band of Enters 2-0. Outside corner strike with the fastball 2-1. and one. Gonzalez, the graduate student from Hialeah. Check swing. No swing as the pitch goes inside and it's 3-1. and one. Pitch 
In the air, right field moving back is McCladdy. He leaps and he can't make the play and it rolls to the wall. It's going to be a stand-up leadoff double for Jose Gonzalez. We, we talked about it a little bit in the break. Van Devender has really shown nothing to earn his spot back on the mound heading into this inning. At, at this point for Jackson State, it's really probably just an issue of not trying to burn that bullpen into the ground first game of a weekend series because another breaky ball that was absolutely hammered the other way. And again, every, the Wildcats are just going with these pitches the other way. That's the second hit Gonzalez has had going to the opposite field. And the first pitch, the breaking ball hit in the air to right field by Irvin Escobar. That is going to get down, and it's going to be a fair ball. Escobar goes to second. Gonzalez is going to round third. The throw to the plate is not in time. They actually go to third. It's going to be a triple for Irvin Escobar. Gonzalez scores, and it's six zip cats. It's just been an all-out disastrous start for a weekend series for Jackson State. Defense has been poor. Pitching has been poor. Boca Bello's been outstanding on the other side, so the offense hasn't been able to get going, and it's not getting any easier. This Wildcats lineup has been relentless. I'm not sure where that ball landed because I was I was caught looking at a note. So I think it landed about 10 or so feet in front of the warning track down the line, just soft enough, and then rolled into the corner from there. Okay. Because usually when a ball is hit in the right field like that, first pitch, check swing, no swing. Ball is low, 1-0 to Manny Soufrain, who... Singled in Gonzalez's first time up and was caught stealing on a strike him out, throw him out, double play to end the first. Here's the pitch lefty to lefty from Vandeventer. It is grounded towards second. Fielded on a big hop by White, underhands the first. And he looks back, has Kamar at third. He'll stay put one down in the inning. But yeah, so if, if that ball rolled into the corner, and we've seen a lot of times the right field corner now near the Budweiser bullpen is uh, the area of uncertainty for right fielders across the world. Here's Irvin Escobar. First pitch to him, breaking ball swing. And it makes it way, way early on that. As another ball escapes the Jackson State dugout and rolls onto the field. So now Coach Hernandez wants that pitch to be null and void. So we'll see what the Empires do with this one. And. And again, head coach Omar Johnson is in a heated debate with the umpires. And I think the umpires are giving him a warning about keeping bullpen discipline. Because that's the third time we've seen a ball roll into play from that first base bullpen. It's like, what can you do over there? The bullpen catchers, I'm sure, doing the best they can. It may not bode well for who comes out of the bullpen next if they're missing the bullpen catcher. Zero, zero, so they did call no pitch on that last one. So this is a correction. Jorge Gonzalez's Febo is up. Irvin Escobar leads off of thirds. Pitch. Breaking ball misses outside 1-0. and Febo was part of that strike him out, throw him out double play that ended the first inning. And would love to drive home Escobar here with one out in the third. Breaking ball strike 1-1. One and one. Gonzalez Fabo can be a, a big swing, home run hitting type of player, but the walks have to come. That's really the big thing that could unlock his game. Big swing and a miss at a pitch in the dirt. It's one and two, and also swinging to pitches like that. There's, well, there's not as much plate discipline as you would like in somebody that really is only hitting for power. I mean, how many guys in the major leagues nowadays do we see that just are home run, walk, strikeout? Well, those guys, the walk numbers are up, and they're not there with Fabo when he's swinging at pitches like that. The one, two, big swing and a miss at a breaking ball in the opposite batter's box, and he's down on strikes for the second time in the game. Game. There's two away, and now here's Ramsey's Cordova. That's tough. Gonzalez Fabo has been the one guy who's kind of looked outclassed by a pitcher that's otherwise not been solid to anybody. Yeah, both strikeouts Vander Vader has thrown have both been to Gonzalez Fabo. There's Ramsey's Cordova, who let off the second with a ground bird a short his first time off. He chops one foul outside of third, and it's 0 1. Jose Gonzalez led off the inning with a double to deep right field. Then Escobar tripled him home with a another one down the right field line. Then Soufrain grounded out. Fevo struck out. Here's the 0-1 in the dirt. 1-1 one one to Cordova. 
who on the season only has 12 RBIs. He pops one straight up, but straight back foul, and it's one and two. Wildcats try to increase their already 6 nothing lead here in the bottom of the third and are already working on their late second time through the order pitch. Breaking ball misses the zone low, two and two. And there's another ball that just about nearly sailed over here. It was a little closer to the Jackson State dugout, so some guys stepped over to grab it. Two, two. That one's hammered toward third, but caught on a line by Montesano and in the inning is over. One run, two hits, one left. And we go to the fourth inning of play. It's six nothing Bethune Cookman here on Cat Eye Network Radio. To the fourth inning we go here at the Jack. Wildcats have a 6-0 lead. And Joseph Eichelberger leads off. Grounded out to third base his first time up. Tanner Bocabello on 37 pitch pitches. Pitch 38 is a fastball that misses in on the hands, and it's 1-0. Bocabello in that complete game shutout of Florida A&M two weeks ago through 112 pitches. Breaking ball, chop foul, straight back, and it's one of one So we know he's got the stamina to go the distance in these games if he keeps the pitch count down in these middle innings. Tanner deals. Outside, two and one. And of course, he's been backed up by some spectacular defense, especially the left-hand side of that infield. Cordova and Gonzalez Febo have both made some Impressive plays. Here's the 2 1. Fastball chop foul into the netting on the first base side, and it's 2 and 2. And I think the most exciting thing about Bocabello, especially over the last couple of weekends, has been how he's just looked the part of a Friday night guy. You know, Nolan Santos last year was so, so different type of pitcher that we're used to seeing at this league, but it's reminiscent of a couple years ago when Lewis Lipthrap did that job and just pounds the zone, works his defense, and has that confidence. Ground ball towards second. Olison on to first, and it's one away. And that's the kind of contact Tanner Bocabello feeds off. Of. He's not going to be your triple-digit strikeout guy towards the end of the season. He's not going to blow you away with his stuff. But he's going to get soft contact like that, and we've seen it so much, right? One, two, three, four, five, now six, seven ground outs on the infield through four to third. First pitch fouled away by Robert Tate who grounded out his first time up, and it's 0-1. Of course, you need your infielders to be the top of the game if you're going to play like that. Here's the 0-1. Oh, up by his head, forces Tate to back away, and it's 1-1. Uh, one one. But even in a pitch like that, you see the difference between Boca Bello and then on the other end of Jackson State is when he's missing, it's not hurting him. When Van Deventer's missing, it's getting taken the other way. Breaking ball low. And it's two and one. Yeah, Bocabello, maybe not on the command side tonight as he was in his previous starts. 
but he's getting that soft contact. 2-1. Fastball, line foul, first base side, 2-2. Two and two. And he is really attacking Tate in on the hands with that fastball. And you see Tate frustrated that he can't straighten that one out. He's done that across the board to all the right-handers. He's really lived in on the hands, and, and guys have swung at him. Guys are swinging at pitches down by their knees on the inside half of the plate and on their hands, even up top. They're giving it to him, and he's taking advantage. 2-2. Two, two, he shakes off a pitch from Escobar. Now comes set and winds and fires. Ground ball towards short. Cordova to his left. Nice reverse scoop and a nice pick at first by Soufrain as well for the outs. Jackson State just can't catch a break. This is the kind of complete effort across the board from the Wildcats that is a, a championship That's type of effort. You know, you're not opening any windows. You're taking care of business on every single side of the ball, and they've done that so far, not giving Jackson State any signs of life. Really, the one blemish defensively for the Wildcats was Bocabello walking Hibbler in the last inning, and then he stole and got the third on an error, but of course that didn't come back to bite him. Squaring to bunt and taking a ball outside is Miles White, who struck out to start the second. One of only two strikeouts for Bocabello thus far. Got Lenny Montesano to strike out to end last inning with a runner on third. Here's the 1-0. In there for a strike. Fastball outside corner, 1-1. One and, one. and even when he's got runners on in the first inning and the third inning, Mocabella's just continued to work, continue to force ground balls and get the strikeout here and there. There's the breaking ball that catches the zone at the knees, and it's 1-2. and two. Surprised they got the strike call on that one. That one's, I don't feel like Vandevender has gotten that low strike call as much as Bocabello has. One, two, two down. Breaking ball. Punched him out. And a big fist pump from Bocabello as he walks off the mound. That was a beautiful slider. Just cut across right at the knees. And down go the Jet Tigers. One, two, three in the fourth. We go to the bottom of the inning. Still 6 nothing Cats here on Cat Eye Network Radio. Nine-hole hitter Colton Olison leads off for Bethune-Cookman here in the bottom of the fourth. The Wildcats have a 6-0 lead in what's been pretty comfortable for the Cats so far as Garrett Vandeventer continues his journey on the mound for the Tigers today. He just threw his 65th pitch at the 1-0. Is a strike call at the knees, 1-1. One one. Olison flew out to deep center his first time up. And he's really been looking to crush the ball. Maybe his last 10 plate appearances. And he does rip that one down the third baseline, but foul, and it's one and two. He's swinging with a lot more anger than I've seen him swing with in the last couple of years. The one, two. That one's ripped towards short, but caught on a line by Tate. And there's one down. I think that was a nice idea, nice swing on the ball, and a little bit of unluck there. I was about to say, when you swing at that kind of anger, you got to make sure that it doesn't result in whiffs and or just a lot of high fly balls that don't do a whole lot of good. And Olison's been such a good job of being that situational guy managing the pitches. So we'll see how the rest of the night fares for him. So back to the top of the order, Daniel Figueroa pulls back a bunt and takes a slider strike. Figueroa was hit by a pitch, stole a base, and scored his first time up, then doubled and scored his second, and he grounds one toward third. Playing in is Montesano. He makes the play, and there's two down. 
Finally, a little bit of momentum for Vandermeer. Number 34, Garrett. But still all on contact in the field of play. Yeah. He still only has two strikeouts, both to Jorge Gonzalez Febo. Everybody else has made contact. And with two quick outs, here's Garrett Chan. First pitch to him is a slider strike, slashes right through the middle, and it's so in one. Chan singled to left in the first. That scored Figueroa pitch. Watches a fastball low, one and one. Then he reached on an error in the second. That ended up scoring Figueroa from second. Van Deventer gets a swing and a miss out of Chun, and it's one and two. Wouldn't be surprised if this is Garrett's last inning, third time through the order for the Cats. Pitch. Breaking ball misses outside two and two, especially if Chun gets on base here and extends the inning with Van Deventer already at 70 pitches. That one laced toward left field. That is going to get down for a base hit. It dropped straight out of the air in front of Eichel Berger. And Chun does extend the inning, and the Wildcats have a two-out single. That's a really nice piece of opposite field hitting on a ball that's trailing away from Chun again, but he goes the other way. Wildcats have had success in a number of different ways tonight at the point. Rivera. Rivera singled to right on a ground ball. That scored Garrett Chun in the first, then reached on a fielder's choice that ended the second. First pitch to him. He lines one to left field, straight at Eichelberger, who makes the catch to end the inning. No runs, one hit, one left. We go to the fifth inning of play. 6 nothing Bethune-Cookman here on the Cat Eye Network. We head to the fifth here at Jackie Robinson Ballpark. Tanner Bocabello back out there. Sebastian Cabeza will lead it off. He flied out to right his first time up. Cabeza, a junior from Aurora, Illinois, and a transfer from Taft College. And Bocabello's first pitch. Sinker in the zone for strike one. This Jackson State team, like Bethune-Cookman, keeps very few players from their 2023 campaign. The one, the 0-1, well, goes with the sinker again, puts it in the exact same spot, and it's 0-2. Only one starter tonight returns from the team last year for Jackson State. That's Miles White. Here's the 0-2. Slider misses outside, 1-2. I don't think it's a coincidence when you look at teams like this and then of Alabama State as well that have lost so many guys that Florida A&M and Bethune-Cookman who've kept many of their leadership players have remained strong at the top. Fouled away, we'll do the one-two again. Again, Bocavello attacking right-handed hitters in on the hands. Really, all they can do is just fight them off. Beza barely catches one and taps its foul straight back to the net. That was a fastball at about the bill of his helmet. Still offered at it. And 
Vocavella probably disappointed he didn't get the out right there. Once again, the one-two. That one's grounded towards short. Field and firing across is Cordova. One down, another punch out for Ramsey's Cordova. This Jackson State team is, is such an interesting one because they come out of the gate playing a non-conference schedule that doesn't tell us a whole lot. And then they work into, you know, beating Alabama State two, in, in two games. The third game was, was postponed. But an Alabama State team that we now look is continued to struggle, but then they play teams like Pine Bluff, Valley, and finally go into the Florida a m series where they get swept. And now we're looking at this score. First pitch is low ball one to Hassan Standifer. He grounded out to short his first time up. One of six putouts by Ramsey's Cordova in the ball game. We are in the top of the fifth pitch. Ball just missed the knees. It's 2-0. Oh. So, you know, at, at the SWAC East, it remains the big four, Alabama State, Jackson State, Bethune-Cookman, and Florida a &M. but there may be a bigger gap this year than we saw last that year. That one hammered to right center field and deep. Going back, Figueroa, he... Did he make the catch? He made the catch. Uh, Tanner Bocabello was standing right between me and Figueroa, so I could not see that. So it's a fly out, and there's two away. That was the hardest hit ball the Tigers have had since the first inning. And now here's the nine-hole hitter, Letty Alvarez, grounded out short his first time up. First pitch to Alvarez. He swings and pops it high in the air down the first baseline. Foul. And out of play. Alvarez, a sophomore from Ecuador. Started his collegiate career at Allen College in the SIAC. The pitch. That one hit high in the air down the third baseline. Moving over Garrett Chun towards the bullpen makes the catch. To end the inning. A nice long run from yeah, Chun. He actually fielded that one in foul territory near that little um, chain link fence right before the clubhouse. One, two, three, go the Tigers. We go to the bottom of the fifth. It's 6 0 Bethune Cookman here on Cat Eye Network Radio. Jose Gonzalez will lead it off for the Wildcats here in the bottom of the fifth. They've got a 6 nothing lead. And Van Deventer still on the mound. Misses outside to the righty with a fastball, and it's 1-0. Longest outing of the season for Van Deventer as that one's grounded up the middle and through for a base hit. The leadoff man aboard for Bethune Cookman. They've had that leadoff man aboard in three of the five innings so far. And Gonzalez is now three for three. Single, double, single. Started the season with that 25-game hitting streak that came to an end Tuesday night, right back where he left off. And now here's Irvin Escobar. Bunted a man over in the first. First pitch to him. Swing and a miss. Way early on that breaking ball. And it's 0-1. Then in the third, he tripled down the right field line. It went all the way to the corner. And that scored Gonzalez. The 0-1. That one chopped right back to Van Deventer. On to second for one. Back to first double play. First double play of the night turned by either team, and there's two down. It's hard to say there's any 
momentum for Jackson State, but finally, at least for Van Devent, they've been able to put down a couple of solid innings and just looked a little more in control. I think that's credit to the Wildcats, maybe being a little more aggressive at the plate. But he's definitely been hitting his spots more and been able to find the zone and giving them something to think about. And now with two down, here's Maddie Soufrain. And the first pitch to him is a ball outside and low. 1-0. I guess you can count the strike him out, throw him out double play in the first as a double play. First traditional double play of the game. 1-0. That time finds the outside corner, and it's 1-1. One one. We talk about this basically every time Manny Soufrain comes to the plate. Is, is every pitcher wants to play Manny Soufrain away in the outside batter's box. It happens again as there's a ball low and away, 2-1. and one. And Deventer works quickly. And it's way outside. Cabeza had to stretch his left arm way out there to grab it. Three and one. So I think the big thing that Manny Soufrain can add to his game. Here's the three one. There's a strike. And it's three and two. Soufrain not happy about it. It was on the outside corner. It's just to reach his bat across Soufrain. Just poke one into left field. Here's the full count delivery with two down. Swing and a miss. Got him with the slider. Soufrain way out ahead of it. No runs, one hit, and nobody left. And we go to the sixth. Six nothing. Bethune Cook went over Jackson State here on Cat Eye Network Radio. Doc, back to the top of the order for Jackson State as we go to the sixth inning. Jordan McClady to face Tanner Bocabello for the third time. McClady's grounded out to the left side of the infield twice. And the first pitch to him is a ground ball foul first base side into the Jackson State dugout, 0-1. The ground ball to short to lead off the game was pretty routine, but the one to third base was anything but, and he skies one to center field. Figueroa going back, and he makes the catch. About five steps ahead of the track, and there's one down. But back on the ground out to third, in the third by McClowney, that was the great diving stop across his body, right on the third base bag, and then Fabo got up, fired across to get it. Here's Hibbler now. He's the only... Jackson State Tiger that's been on base multiple times. First pitch to him is outside. 1-0. He singled in the first and was stranded on third after the ground rule double by Monsanto. Montesano, excuse me. And then he walked in the third pitch. Swing, and it hit him. Ooh. I thought for a second maybe it hit him on the hands as he swung, but I think instead it maybe just bounced off him and, in the leg. Yeah, and he is in a little bit of discomfort walking around behind the plate right now. And he, he he took a big old hack at that one that was coming straight for him. It's another one inside on these right-handed batters. It, it's 
it's crazy to see some of the time these these swack lineups that like this, this approach wouldn't work against a power five. It wouldn't work against Florida State. You just can't keep attacking every single right handed hitter the same way. They're they're gonna change the game plan. Somebody's gonna switch it up. They're gonna start taking pitches, crowding the plate. But every time guys have come up and done the same thing. The one one inside again forces Hibbler to back away, and it's two and one. Then he's using that inside fastball to set up the breaking ball away. Here's the 2-1. He goes to the breaking ball and gets a foul straight back, 2-2. Two and two. He's got a nice pitch mix, can locate off speed, can locate the hard stuff. And even right now, you've got unlimited options of what you can do with this pitch. The 2-2. Two -two. Breaking ball, swing, and a miss. Hibbler was expecting the inside fastball and was way ahead of that changeup. Just can't track down anything inside. And again, he's using that fastball to set up the breaking ball, whether it's in down and away or it's tailing into the zone. It all starts with being able to locate that pitch, being able to punch it in the zone when you have to. Now two down, ground ball up the middle. There's a base hit. That was first pitch swinging from Lenny Montesano. And he hit that one right back where it came from. And that's the first hit for Jackson State since the first inning. And Montesano, not the only guy with hits in this lineup, but the, the only guy who's really looked competitive at the plate for Jackson State. Sure, some guys have put balls in play, but he's worked long ABs and is rewarded with a couple of hits. And now here's Eichelberger, statistically the best hitter for Jackson State. Breaking ball in on the hands, called a strike by Don Andrews behind the plate. And it's 0-1. Eichelberger, a junior from Lithonia, Georgia. And a transfer from Paul D. Camp Community College. Breaking ball right in the middle of the zone. And Eichelberger looks toward the sky in desperation. Like, why didn't I swing at that? One that breaks away from the right-handed batter. So you're expecting one inside on the hands, and it dumps right down the middle. There's a swing and a miss. He got him with the outside breaking ball again. Two strikeouts for Boca Bello in the inning. No runs, one hit, one left. We go to the bottom of the sixth. Six-nothing Wildcats here on the Cat Eye Network. To the bottom of the sixth we go. Jorge Gonzalez Febo leads off. He struck out both of his first two, two times at bat against Garrett Van Deventer, who is still on the hill, 86 pitches deep into an appearance to where he gave up four runs on five hits in the first. There's that slider that finds the outside corner for strike one. That's really been the only thing that's worked for Van Deventer and allowed him to stay in this game. That pitch has saved his outing, no doubt about it. He goes for it again, misses it outside, one and one And see, there's the difference of the first inning sliders, one that looks like that, that breaks straight vertical up and down, and then he gets the one that breaks in on the right, he's that's had success. Low and inside, Febo watches it for ball two. Jorge, again, struck out twice, was part of a strike him out, throw him out double play that ended that four run first for the Cats pitch. Gets one to hit, pops it sky high to right field, not deep. McClady watches it into his glove for out number one. You know, you credit Gonzalez Fable for the defense, but the approach in the plate has shown no change since the start of the season. 
just consistently hunting fences, uppercut swing, and it's not leading to anything. Yeah. Here's Ramsey's Cordova. Grounded out to short in the second and lined out to third in the third. First pitch from Van Deventer low. He was unlucky in the third because he hit that ball about as hard as you can straight at Montesano. All he had to do was just stick out his glove. 1-0 in there for a strike, 1-1. One one. It is a beautiful early spring night at the Jack. Temperature hovering in the mid-60s pitch. Fouled away first base side, and it's one and two. Not a cloud in the sky. The sun has gone down. A pitch black night hangs over us here on the east coast of Florida. Certainly looked like a nice week for Tortuga's opening day. Swing and a miss. The slider again gets another strikeout for Van Deventer, and there's two down. And here's Colton Olison, who's hit two balls pretty hard. He's flied out to center and then lined out to the shortstop. Taint. That was another ball hit really hard, but just right at a defender. Colton looking to break out of this rut at the plate. Big looping breaking ball misses the zone outside. And it's 1-0. Olison batting only 202 on the year. And he takes this one right back up the middle, and it's gonna drop in for a base hit. So the Wildcats once again. Have a runner aboard with two down. And we go back to the top of the order for Daniel Figueroa. Batter at center fielder number one, Daniel Figueroa. And hopefully that gives Colton some confidence since he hit the ball hard three times and finally one finds the ground. Here's Figueroa. Two out in the inning, Olison on first pitch. Breaking ball way outside. Cabeza has to stretch out to get it. 1-0. If nothing else, you got to credit Van Deventer's grit to get through this and save bullpen arms for the weekend because he's done that, if nothing else. 1-0. Swing and a miss at a fastball inside. And it's 1-1. One and one. That's the first time we've really seen a decent fastball because the arm angle from Van Deventer, as I mentioned, is almost flat. And when he comes inside to righties, it can kind of screw up your timing a little bit. Here's the 1-1. One -one. Runner goes. They pitch it to second. Throw to second. Safe! I'm not sure how Colton Olison got in there, but he does have a stolen base without a pitch being thrown. I think it was a combination of a really great jump and maybe a, a lackadaisical throw over by Van Deventer, who thought, you know, you got him in a rundown. We caught him. So it didn't really show the hustle to get to the plate, but either way, you don't see that every day. 2-2. Two, two. Olison goes to third. Strike called, but no throw down there. So two straight stolen bases for Colton. Another who only had jump. five on the season coming into the ninth. And another great jump, and with the righty batter up, maybe didn't want to risk throwing it into left field. Pitch. Ground ball towards short. Tate fields and fires low, but a nice scoop by Standifer at first ends the inning. No runs, one hit, one left. And we go to the seventh inning of play. Still 6 nothing Bethune-Cookman here on the Cat Eye Network.
we go to the top of the seventh. Tanner Bocabello still on the mound for Bethune Cookman. He will face Robert Tate Jr., the shortstop who made the defensive play to end the bottom of the sixth and keep Cookman off the board. And he lines one in the right field down the line for a base hit. First pitch swinging from Tate. And that's the first player for Jackson State outside of Hibbler and Montesano to get on base today. That was pitch number 74 for Bocabello in this game. He'll need a little bit of help, need some quick innings. Certainly not a great start there, but the complete game shutout back-to-back -back is, is within reach. Well, I, I think if you get through this inning scoreless still, and you go to the eighth up by six, spin and throw back to first, Tate dives in there then you can confidently go to your bullpen here. You should, but there is also the issue of, you know, this is your Friday night guy. He's shown that competitive edge before. If he tells you he wants to stay out there, you got to at least think about it. Pitch. Fouled straight back by Miles White, and it's 0-1. White, the only returning starter for this Jackson State team this season, at least tonight. We will see Patrick Womble in to pitch tomorrow. He faced the Wildcats three different times last year. They check back over to first. Tate back in there again. Tate only four stolen bases on five attempts on the year. Not the most prolific base stealer, but they check over a third time, and he's back in there. You wonder how much stress this puts on Bocabello. He, he completely gets out of his rhythm. I've said this a lot about all of the Wildcat pitchers this year. Here's the 0-1 to White. Now they go back over there again. Now it's it's at bats like this that make me long for the major league rule. You can only go over there three times. Pitch. Swing and a miss. Ran the fastball by him down and away. And it's 0-2. It's just at a certain point. You think something's going to change the sixth time you throw over? You're going you're gonna to get him this time? or it, it just disrupts the rhythm on the mound. It's, it's just one more thing to worry about. Nobody out. They throw over there for the fifth time in the at-bat. And it's not even that Tate is getting a big lead. He's not. It's one thing to do it a couple times to keep him close. But his lead is, hasn't changed. And still we throw over. Pitch. Way outside, looking for the pitch out, and it's one and two. I don't mind that. If you want on an 0-2 count, and you think a guy's going to steal, to try and pitch out, that's fine. But don't throw over six times in an at-bat. You just got to be careful to not let the guy in the base pass dictate the way you approach the bat at the plate. Pitch in the dirt, ball two. Nice job by Escobar to prevent it from going to the backstop. But now, if you're Tanner Bocabello, you got to focus on the batter because you don't have that two-pitch lead anymore. And to continue my thought about the Wildcats staff as a whole and this philosophy of trying to check the runner at first so much. Here's the 2-2. Two -two. Ground ball towards short. Flips to second for one. On to first. A big stretch by Soufrain. Oh, and he's off the bag. And Coach Hernandez is out to argue. Well, you would hope that the official was close enough to see it. From our angle and from Coach Hernandez's angle, it's impossible to tell how tiny of a, a gap there was between the cleat of Manny Soufran and the first base bag. So, you know, Coach Hernandez is going to do his managerial duty and show some disdain for it as he always does, but yeah. you would <laughs> like to give the official the benefit of the doubt that he couldn't miss that yeah. from that close. But while we are in a short stop at you play, I want to finish my thought about the, the pit picking off at first, right? The Wildcat pitchers as a staff are all so much better with nobody on base because they're not having to constantly check runners over there. They can just work to their own rhythm. And I'd love to see a stat about how many strikeouts the Wildcats have this year with the bases empty as opposed to with runners on. So now with one down in the inning and a runner on first, here's Sebastian Cabeza, the catcher. First pitch to it, righty to righty, is hammered to left field, coming on his chun. He makes the catch, and having to retreat to first, it's a double play! Double play wow! A lackadaisical 
move on the base pads by Miles White. He thought that ball was going to drop in front of Chun. Garrett caught it on a line and then doubled him off at first. No runs, no hits. Oh, sorry, no runs, one hit, and one left. And we go to the bottom of the seventh. Still 6 nothing Wildcats on the Cat Eye Network. Aaron Chan set to lead off the bottom of the seventh for Bethune Cookman. They lead it six to nothing over Jackson State. First pitch to him is fouled away into the Halifax River on the first base side, and it's 0 and 1. Van Deventer still out there. That was his 100th pitch of the evening. And the 0 1, breaking ball inside 1 and 1. And we were talking during the break as we saw Van Deventer go back out to warm up. and our conclusion must be right, you're just trying to save bullpen arms for a weekend series. Here's the pitch. Check swing. Did he go? Yes. And it's one and two. Boone Cookman finally has a couple of guys trotting down over to the pen to start stretching out. But Jackson State had some people warming up earlier. And now they've all sat down in the dirt, two and two. Well, you, it's always the marathon, not a sprint thing, so you don't want to burn arms. But it's kind of crazy with this guy over 100 pitches to sit the bullpen down completely at this point. There's a strike three called, and Chun knew it. He just watched one go right down the middle, and there's one out. Right fielder As a hitting coach, and it's interesting to, you know, maybe try to get inside the mind of Derek Cartaya and the lineup that has overall slowed over the last, call it, three, two and a half innings or so. Is it a switch in approach? Is it a, a switch in approach on the mound, maybe? First pitch is a ball low to Sergio Rivera. Rivera singled in the first, grounded into a fielder's choice to end the second, and then lined out to left in his three plate appearances. And the 1 0, outside 2 0. As Van Deventer crosses the 105 pitch mark, it's officially his longest downing of the season. Previously, he threw 103 in an 8-2 to two loss to Presbyterian back on the 3rd of last month. Hit in the air down the first baseline. High pop. Long run for McClaney. It goes foul. And the count 2-1. and one. He also threw eight innings against Alcorn State. We do not have pitch data for that game. Just interesting. Seems like a guy who maybe starts slow and works his way in every time he's on the mound. It's not exactly a recipe I'd won for my Friday night guy. But yeah. he's looked like a decent enough pitcher over the last three or so innings yeah. as soon as that slider has kind of figured itself out. But you just, I don't know, you can't really afford to start slow on a Friday night in a series opener. The Wildcats got four in the first. Here's the 2-1. Ground ball towards third, right at Montesano. He knocks it down and then fires across and gets Rivera by half a step. And there's two away. So the Wildcats scored four in the first, one in the second, and one in the third. And since then have three hits. I think part of that, too, is Van Deventer's been staying mostly on the bottom half of the plate and inside, which has either led to weak ground balls 
or the alternative is those high fly balls that don't get very deep that have led to easy outs either way. Here's Jose Gonzalez. First pitch to him is in the dirt. Ball one. He's had a great night. Three singles. No, two singles, a double, and an RBI, and two runs scored. Singled in the first that played in Sergio Rivera ahead of him. Here's the 1-0. Chop foul straight back, 1-1. One one. Then he doubled deep to right field in the third and singled up the middle in the fifth, but was part of a double play. 1-1 one, one with two down. And he watches one in there at the knees, one and two. Gonzalez will beef up his already pretty nice 340 average. He smacks one to right center field. That is going to get down for another base hit. How do you like that? Jose Gonzalez, four for four on the night. And that's the kind of pitch you, you talked about it when Manny Soufrain was at the plate a couple of innings ago. That it just makes life so much easier for you when you have it in your bag. He tried to work him away, keep it away from his bat, and all he does is, you know, sneak his arms out a little bit, get out in front of it, poke it out to the opposite field, and when there's nobody there. And now here's Irvin Escobar. Bunted the runners across in the first, then hit an RBI triple down the first baseline in the third. First pitch to him, swinging a little flare to right field, moving in McClady. He makes the catch. To end the inning. No runs, one hit, one left for the uh, fourth straight inning. And we go to the eighth inning of play. Six nothing Wildcats here on the Cat Eye Network. To the eighth inning we go, Tanner Bocabello back out on the mound as he has a four-hit shutout on 80 pitches to this point. And Hassan Stendifer, the first baseman, will lead it off. He grounded a short in the second and fly to right in the fifth. Pitch. Hit high in the air to right field. Not deep. Long run for Rivera. He makes the catch. And there's one down on one pitch. And you said he was going to have to work some quick innings, Bocabello, if we wanted to get through all nine. That'll help. Well, if he gets through this one, even in the mid-90s, I think he's locked in for that chance to get the complete game shutout. Dylan Dudonez is down there in the bullpen starting to get warm. But I don't think Bocabello's got a shot. Here's the nine-hole hitter, Letty Alvarez, who... Check swing, chopper to third. This will be a tough play for Fabo, and he makes it. Charging and firing across. Two pitches, two outs. Yeah, you you can lock it in. He's Bocabello is going to be out there for the ninth. Right field it, would, it would take a big-time rally from Jackson State to, to change that at this point. And again, we've maligned his offense, but Jorge Gonzalez Fabo has been excellent at the hot corner tonight. Not his usual position. He's played center field. He's played... Right field, he's played third. He's been all over the place. And he does get credit for that. A lot of credit, really. A lot of guys 
you know, shut it down a little bit on, on the defensive side of the ball when the bat's not doing its job, especially as a freshman, to be able to keep that composure, to show that, that grind on the mound, or I should say in the field, it's, it's important. It's important. We have a stoppage of play here. I'm not sure why. I think it's just a traditional manager's meeting with his batter. Oh, except okay, for so we have a, a, a offensive timeout. Except for, you know, traditionally, the Wildcats coaches will kind of come out towards the batter. Omar Johnson kind of just stayed in his spot. Yeah, really so I, I was confused because Jordan McClady went all the way back to the dugout. I thought he might have been being substituted, but no, he stands in. Here's the first pitch to him. There's the strike. And I'm, I, I think that the the message from the coaching staff must have been just take one. Don't, don't let him get out of here on three pitches. Sometimes that's all it takes. Here's the 0-1. Outside, check swing, no swing. And it's one and one. McLeod grounded to short in the first, third in the third, and then flew out the center in the sixth. He's made contact every time. There's a check swing. He did not go again. And it's three and one. So now Bocabello, who has not been behind in counts very much tonight. Correction, it's two and one. Uh, the point still stands. He's got to work from behind here. Pitch. Fouled away, two and two. And, and that's the kind of pitch you expect from a guy down two one. He attacked up in the zone, in on the hands. But still in that area of uncertainty where McLeodie had to attack it or risk getting it called a strike. Here's the two two. And it's just low, and it's three and two. Thought he was going to maybe get the punch out there on the fastball at the knees, but we'll see one more. And Tanner deals. Ground ball, that's a base hit right back up the middle. McLaddy, long turn at first. He'll retreat back there as Figueroa fires in. So another two-out hit for Jackson State. Yeah. And it'll be Rodney Hibbler Jr. to bat now. He's maybe been the most successful at the plate tonight. Singled in the first, walked, stole, reached on third on an error, and was stranded on third in the third, and then struck out in the sixth. Two outs with McLaddy on first, and they pick him off, try to pick him off anyway, and it's not successful. Who could have seen that coming? <laughs> you know, something tells me we might see another one. Even though, well, McLaddy is one of those threats to steal. Pitch. Breaking ball in the dirt. Ball gets away. And down to second without a throw goes McLaddy. So, well, well, I'm not sure whether to give pass ball or wild pitch on that. I will leave that up to our statistician, Brian Harvey. Looks like it will go in as a wild pitch. A wild pitch. A ball in the dirt, probably probably the right call. You hate to penalize catcher for that. So, it's 1-0. and oh, And, it, again, in this situation with two outs, Bocabello just has to go at the hitter. The 1-0 pitch. There's a sinker that finds the middle of the zone for strike one. Bocabello doesn't go for that sinker often. But he does mix it in sometimes. Here's the 1-1. Breaking ball tapped foul and into Escobar, who is a little bit shaken up. Looks like it got him in the right leg. Right where the padding isn't. You know, Bocabello's start tonight has been interesting. He started off in the first inning throwing just about all breaking balls. Then from there, he started starting guys off with the fastball. And then he started really, you know, locking in on that inner half of the plate, especially on the right-handers. And now as we get to the end of it, he's kind of back to mixing it up a little bit. We're seeing more and more breaking balls. He's starting out guys with breaking balls. See what he goes through to finish here. One, two, two down with a runner on second. Bocabello deals. Fastball high, gets a pop-up foul straight back. And that'll hit the roof behind us. Thankful that there is a roof now on, on Jackie Robinson Ballpark. That might have been in our laps, <laughs> if not. A roof, some lights, some wiring left to be finished, mostly upstairs. Boy, Tortuga's opening on Tuesday here at the Jack. Right? They're certainly leaving it late. We'll do the 1-2 again. Pitch. Hammered into right center field. That is going to drop in front of the diving Figueroa and go all the way to the wall. Rounding third and coming home is McLeodie. He'll score and sliding into third with a triple 
is Rodney Hippler Jr. The Jackson State Tigers are finally on the board. It's six to one. And I, I don't mind the dive there from Figueroa out there in right center field. I think at this point you're trying to save that that uh, complete game shutout for Bocabello. You're not really at risk here of imploding, at least at this point. So you look at that and you say it's probably a double if he just lets it bounce in front of him, corrals it from there. But I don't mind necessarily the dive in a situation like that. Yep. Well, now here is Lenny Montesano with a runner on third and two down. First pitch from Boca Bello. Chop foul into the dugout on the first base side. And it's so and one. Montesano hit a ground rule double to deep left center his first time up. It barely missed being a homer. And he struck out in the third and singled up the middle of the sixth. Pitch. Ground ball softly tapped back to Bocabello. He's off the mound. He'll take it all the way to first himself. The rare one U is in effect. And one run, two hits, and one left for Jackson State. We go to the bottom of the eighth. It's six to one. Bethune Cook went over Jackson State here on Cat Eye Network Radio. Bottom eight, we go here at the Jack. Michael Torillo, Bryce Wynoski, happy to have your company. First of a three-game set between the Tigers of Jackson State and Bethune Cookman. Wildcats lead this one six to one, and the first pitch is low to Soufrain, and it's one and zero. Oh. Soufrain one for three. Pitch, breaking ball, slices through the zone for strike one. Singled and was caught stealing in the first, then grounded out to second in the third and struck out in the fifth. And Van Deventer still on the hill for Jackson State. Throws one in the dirt, one and two, uh, sorry, two and one. 114 pitches for Garrett Van Deventer. And then finally is some work being done in the Jackson State bullpen as Soufrain foul tips one straight down at the plate, and it'll be two and two. It's at this point now that you know, Miles Thomas has been down there all game, warm. and Well, he, you know, he went back to the dugout for a while, for about four innings. He now did, but back. my point is more that you have him warmed up anyway, pretty extensively, to the point that if you don't throw him, he still has already gotten enough action in the bullpen that you kind of burn him to a certain extent anyway. Here's the 2-2. Two -two. Check swing. Did he go? Yes. Strikeout number two on the night for Manny Soufrain, and there's one down. Well, I, I got to say, outside the first three innings, Van Der Venter has been spectacular. He's only allowed four hits, and he struck out four. So, of course, after the third inning. First pitch on the way, sky high pop, foul first base side, out of play. This is Jorge Gonzalez Febo, who struck out twice and flied out to center. Wildcats trying to nurse this six to one lead. It was six to nothing after the third inning, and it's been that way ever since. Here's the 0-1. Febo squares to bunt, takes a slider strike on the outside corner, 0-2. And 
And Vandeventer gets a strikeout looking. Babo just watched it all the way. Two strikeouts now for Vandeventer on the night. He has eight Ks. Like you said, minus the first couple innings, which I know is a lot to take off the board, he, he's been spectacular. First pitch, swing and a miss at a ball in the dirt from Ramsey's Cordova. And really, if you're the Jackson State coaching staff, there's no need to take him out now. Even at 122 pitches. That one's in the dirt. And it's one and one. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a pitcher get better to this degree as an outing has gone into triple digits. Here's the one one. Breaking ball fouled away off the end of the bat. And it's one and two. I know we've harped on it a couple of times, but it's really once that slider started moving in on right-handed batters, it allowed his curve, it allowed the fastball to open up his options, it allowed him to miss and get swings and misses. One, two, strike three, looking. So Garrett Vandeventer strikes out the side, two looking, and he potentially has a complete game on 124 pitches. But the Wildcats still lead six to one. They're three outs away from getting this done. We go to the ninth here on the Cat Eye Network. To the ninth inning we go, Wildcats with a 6-1 to one lead. And Tanner Bocabello, maybe not out there for a complete game shutout because he gave up one in the last inning, but he is on for another complete game here to save bullpen arms first of a three-game series, and that's really all you can ask for for your Friday night starter. Breaking ball finds the zone. This is Joseph Eichelberger, who's 0 for 3. Grounded a third in the first, grounded to second in the fourth, and struck out in the sixth. And Tanner winds and fires. Breaking ball, foul outside of third. And it's 0-2. And I mentioned earlier about two-out base runners and two-out hits. And it, Jackson said it had a two-out single in the sixth. And, of course, the two two-out hits in the eighth, that allowed them to score the run. That one goes inside one and two. We appreciate your company here on this Friday evening in Daytona Beach. Here's the one, two in the dirt, two and two. So maybe not as much as in previous series, Florida A&M and Alabama State come to mind. As the two out hits come back to hurt the Wildcats. There's a swing and a miss. Got him with the slider. And Eichelberger goes down swinging for the second time of the game. One down in the top of the ninth. Just a classic Bocabello outing. You know, just the one walk. Strikeout number is not massive, but he gets them occasionally. He's got six now tonight. And he's worked to contact. And it's worked out for him. Efficient innings. Quick start. Worked well with a lead. Been excellent. Breaking ball, tap foul back to the screen by Robert Tate Jr. That was pitch number 101 for Tanner Bocabello. Tate grounded out to short in the first pitch. He swings and misses at a curveball, and it's 0-2. And then he grounded out to short again in the fourth. Single then was part of a double play in the seventh. And the 0-2... Outside and low, one and two. Uh, Bocabello all night has been getting ahead 0 and 2 and then throwing a couple garbage pitches just to see if they'll swing at it. And it, it's resulted in some 
situations where he throws a few extra pitches where he didn't really need to. Here's the one, two. He challenged him, and it goes off of the leg of Manny Soufran. It's going to be an infield single. Tough play. I don't think that'll be credited with an error. Just hit so hard. Soufran down on his knees just trying to keep it in front of him, and he does. Oh, it is credited as an error. Really? All right, well, we'll give the error to Soufran at first. Wouldn't be surprised if they go in and change that one later. I'll certainly now, give the evil eye over to our stats table. <laughs> Here's Miles White, first pitch in the dirt, ball one. White has struck out twice, once swinging, once looking, and then reached on a fielder's choice in the seventh and then was caught in a double play after a line out to left. The pitch in the opposite batter's box, and it's 2-0. And he was already committed to going to second. Couldn't retreat back to first fast enough. Bocabello long look in. And the pitch. Swing and a chopper foul at home plate. And it's two and one. I remember in the ninth inning of the complete game shutout against Florida A&M two weeks ago. Bocabello did struggle in the ninth pretty much more than any other inning. Had two on in that inning and eventually worked out of it to end the game. Here is the 2-1. Breaking ball strike outside corner. White rolls his head back in frustration and it's 2-2. Two and two. Yeah, against Florida a &M, Coach Hernandez came out for that ninth inning meeting on the mound, calmed his guy down, told him this is your game, take care of business. Not sure Bocabella will need it tonight. 2-2. Two, two. Breaking ball chopped toward third. On to second. 4-1. On to first. And the ball gets away from Soufrain. Wait, is the runner safe at second? No, the runner is out at second. Um, Robert Tate continued to hang around there. Olison tried to turn the double play, but he had Tate all up in his grill. <laughs> I'm not sure what was going on over there at first. Uh, Manny Soufrain was aggressively tagging Miles White over by the bag. Hernandez asking for a little bit of... Yeah, Co Coach Hernandez, and I think rightly so, is going to ask about the slide at second because it, it looked like, maybe not maliciously, but Robert Tate did come over the bag a little bit to try and prevent that turn at second. I think for the most part, the game of baseball as a whole has done a pretty good job of eliminating that kind of play from the game. You don't really see it as aggressively as we have in the past. And I think for the better of the game, you know, as much as you may say you enjoy those bang bang plays at second it's you don't want to be a second baseman it gets raked like that yeah with a cleat or, or, or something worse so I, I think it's it's good for the game that that's happened again like you said i don't think that was a malicious one so i don't think it will be overturned it'd be quite the anticlimactic way to end a, a ball game if it was well, all the umpires i think are going to get together and talk about it I, I actually have a personal story about that i i still have uh, a scar on my right leg from when I was playing second base and trying to turn a double play, and I got hit by somebody wearing metal spikes in a in a rec league game when I was in high school. So it, it does happen. Like the last time I remember one that truly felt malicious at the major league level was probably back 2018, 17 or so. Manny Machado had one against the Red Sox that was a little controversial for a while. They will call him out but I think that's just the original runner. So maybe that wasn't the play. Maybe that wasn't the call from Coach Hernandez. Maybe just asking for some. Okay, so so that answers that question. Is they weren't as, apparently the officiating crew somehow got it misconstrued that they were asking to confirm the out at second, which was already called an out. Yeah, so Coach Hernandez wants to know if the batter should be called out because of the uh, a malicious slide at second base by Robert Tate Jr., and it will not happen that way. So there's two outs in the ninth, and White on first after the fielder's choice. The final ups for Jackson State will be the catcher, Sebastian Cabeza, who is 0 for 3, but he's put the ball in play three times. He's flying to right, grounded a short, and lined to left. First pitch to him. Low, slow breaking ball catches the inside corner for strike one as the whole bench is on their feet. For Bethune Cookman, trying to cheer Tanner Bocabella to another complete game victory pitch. Breaking ball towards third and past the diving glove of Fabo, and it'll be a base hit. White goes to second, and there's two on with two outs. 
Wouldn't be shocked if we see a mound visit from Coach Hernandez here. We will, just to kind of similar to what we saw against Florida a and I don't think we're going to see a call to the bullpen here, but it's going to be a kind of a similar conversation. It's your game. You've earned the chance to finish this one off. Bocabello at 111 pitches to this point. Just yep. settle down a little bit and finish the job. Yeah. Wildcats, in that last inning on 322 against Florida A&M, there were two ground outs to short, then a single, a single, and then a strikeout that ended the game. That's how that ninth inning went. So it's kind of similar to how we've gotten here. This inning started with a strikeout to Echelberger, an error at first by Suffrain on a ball hit straight at him. Then a fielder's choice by White and a single by Cabeza makes their two on and two out. And it'll be Hassan Standifer, who also is 0 for 3, but he's put the ball in play every time. A ground out and two flyouts to right pitch. There's a strike outside corner 0 and 1. Wildcats up 6 to 1. They've got 11 hits this evening. Pitch. Breaking ball, swing and a miss for strike two. So, Bocabella one strike away. The sparse crowd here at the Jack makes some noise. Here's the pitch. Swing and a chopper foul right at home plate. And we'll do the 0-2 again. Well, Cabela trying to finish this one off just as he's had success all night. Attacking guys going right in. Not trying to pick corners. Not trying to sneak one in there. Going right at him. Did it with the breaking ball. Did it with the fastball. We'll see what he tries to go with to finish this one off. The 0-2 to Standifer. Is upstairs. Way upstairs. Missed his spot. And it's 1-2. and two. And again... 0-2 count, and Pocabello starts trying to nibble at the corners. Don't mind a high fastball here, but got to make sure it's not that high. Pocabello deals. That one lasered over the leeching glove of Olison and into right field. Coming home is White. He will score. It's an RBI single for Standifer, and it's 6-2. Well, fortunately for Bocabello, if that one does remain an error on Manny Soufrain, and I think it will at this point, I don't see the ERA go any higher as that one will go in as an unearned run. I, do I think, think that might be see, the end of Bocabello. We will see a change. Yeah, that'll be the end for Tanner Bocabello. Another Herculean effort, but just couldn't get it done in the ninth. He will finish... With 116 pitches, go eight and two-thirds innings, allow two runs on eight hits, only one of those earned, a walk and six strikeouts. And again, the thing that Tanner Bocabello has done the best this season is just not walk, guys. Only six all year. I think it's really the key to success, in this, obviously at any level of baseball, but in this conference, the guys that don't walk batters, are the guys that are at the top of the league. That's why Daniel Gaviria was named preseason pitcher of the year, because last year he didn't walk, guys. It's pretty simple. You know, it almost feels sorry to have to say it, that it's that easy. But when you don't walk, guys, in this league, you, you set the whole the whole weekend up for success. Let's As Dylan Dudonis warms up, let's go through some other scores around the SWAC as we have them. I'll give the page one more refresh just to see if any other finals have come in. Mississippi Valley State falls to Alabama A&M 14-4. That's a run rule in seven innings. Alcorn State and Grambling State do not have a final score reported. Grambling... What? Why does why does the website have Alcorn State and Grambling State and then Grambling State playing player review? I, I'm not sure how that works. Swack so website's a little. <laughs> anyway, Grambling State beat Prairie View 19 to three. Florida A&M beat Alabama State 10 to two, and Texas Southern beat Southern, the team that beat LSU this week, 20 to one. The joys of baseball at any level. That's that's kind of what you get. 
you know, I, I, I said it to some folks on our staff after the Tuesday night at, at UCF or, or here versus UCF when the Wildcats got smacked around pretty good. I'm like, I bet you they give Florida State a game the next day. And sure enough, they absolutely do to a, to a nationally ranked team, a, a, a better team than UCF. And it's just the nature of the game. I'm trying to see if I can sort out that Alcorn State score the swag website kind of pulls from everybody's website so alcorn state is well they played texas southern today well we'll sort that out later dylan dudonis is on the mound for bethune cookman to try and get that one final out the batter will be letty alvarez he's 0 for three two ground outs and a fly out to right and the first pitch to him is a breaking ball outside of the righty 1-0. and Dudonis, the junior from Jacksonville, a transfer from Florida State College at Jacksonville. Righty to righty, here's the pitch. It's outside, missed with the fastball, 2-0. and Okay, so the Texas Southern Southern game is actually the Texas Southern and Alcorn State game. Oh, okay. And Alcorn State is actually playing Pine Bluff, correct? Southern is playing. Oh, Southern Pine playing Pine Bluff. Bluff. Correct. All right. Here's the 2 0. There's a strike. Late call from Don Andrews behind the plate, and it's 2 and 1. Two outs in the ninth. A run already in to make it 6 to 2, Bethune Cookman. Runners at the corners. Cabeza on third. Standifer on first after back-to-back -back singles. Breaking ball misses outside. Three and one now. And if you're Dylan Dudonis, all you have to do is just find the strike zone because more than not a ball in play is, is going to be picked up by this defense who has been stellar tonight outside the one error by Soufrain, which is debatable that that should even be called an error because the ball was hit so hard. I think it'll probably stay at this point just to preserve the ERA of Boca Bello a little bit. You know, as a coach, you'd probably rather take the error on the first baseman than the pitcher's ERA. 3-1. Fouled away at its 3-2. and two. That was the pitch for Dudonis. Inside corner, fastball, challenged the right-handed hitter. Nothing wrong with going back to it either. Wildcats trying to go to 8-1 and one on the SWAC season and start this Three-game series against Jackson State off with a win. They lead it 6-2. to two. Top of the ninth, two outs. Runners on the corners. Here's the pitch to Alvarez. And he walks, and the bases are loaded. Some life in that Jackson State pen. Tying run at the plate. And it'll be the leadoff man, Jordan McClady. Remember, he's batting 373 on the season with two homers and 20 RBIs. And some encouraging words shouted to the mound by Irvin Escobar. Dylan Dudon is not a closer, really. More of a middle innings, maybe get some starts in an off week kind of guy. And there is some hurried warming up going on to the Bethune-Cookman bullpen. Looks like Pablo Torres is down there. First pitch, breaking ball strike. And it's 0-1 to McGlady, who grounded out twice to the left side of the infield, once to short, once to third. Flying out to center in the sixth and then singled and scored in the eighth on the triple by Rodney Hibbler. Pitch. Breaking ball in the dirt. One of one. And for the Wildcats, who eat after the first inning where they scored four runs, have been in cruise control all night. Things getting dicey here. Bases loaded in the ninth for Jackson State. Dudonis deals. Inside and low. They go back to first, and the throw is wide. I mean, I know you're still in a semi-comfortable position here runs-wise, but that's that's an ill-advised play there to try to throw over to first. Nearly well, saw that one sail under the bullpen. If, if that's a better throw, Alvarez is out because he was way off the bag. But the throw was halfway to the... Jackson State dugout, and Manny Soufrain had to race over to grab it. Here's the 2-1. Swing and a miss. Got him with the sinker, and the Wildcats are one strike away for the second time in the ballgame. 2-2. Two, two, two out. 
Bases loaded in the ninth in a four-run game. Here's the pitch. Fly ball. Left field. Garrett Chun tracking. He takes three steps in and makes the catch. This one belongs to the maroon and gold as the light show happens here. The brand new lights that just got put in at the Jack. Wildcats take this one six to two. Well, they made us sweat it out a little bit, Bryce, but it is a victory for Bethune Cookman. And I think, you know, if you're a coach, you probably would want your team to blow everybody out every night. But as a coach, especially at the collegiate level, when guys are so impressionable and guys are, are, are so dependent on the locker room environment and everything else. I think you kind of like to see a game like this on occasion because it gives you plenty to work with. You know, Vocabello comes out and does a, a, a vast majority of the heavy lifting. He does his thing tonight. Understood. That's what you expect from your Friday night guy. The lineup kind of got in cruise control. You said it a little bit at the end there. You, you can look all the way back to the first inning even when you have Manny Soufrain trying to steal second with one out and – plenty to work with after you saw the kind of lackluster start from uh van de venner on the mound and from there kind of cruised a little bit so you got to just remind guys to stay locked in at the plate never be complacent with the lead you have thankfully many of the other you know marginal things went right for the wildcats tonight namely the defense was outstanding as it always is which is always something this team can can hang its hat on but it, there's plenty to build with on this BCU lineup tonight. Don't get don't get too comfortable, especially like a team like Jackson State that doesn't mind playing from behind. Yeah, and of course, we'll see in the next two games of the series, right? This Jackson State team can hit the ball and score a lot of runs. And they threatened tonight a couple of occasions, but the Wildcats just held them to two. Tanner Bocabello gets the win. He goes to 4-0. and oh. Garrett Vandeventer picks up the loss. He drops a 3-3. Three and three. Save goes to Dylan Dudonis, his first of the season wildcats win this one they get six runs on 11 hits make two errors and leave one two three four five on base and jackson state gets two runs on eight hits they commit one error and leave eight on base wildcats go to 16 and 13 and 8 and 1 in the SWAC. Jackson State falls to 20 and 9 and 5 and 4 in the SWAC. We mentioned their, their non conference schedule, of course, but everybody thought coming into conference play, I mean, oh, what is this Jackson State team that's, you know, 18 and 3 at the time? But it's kind of fallen off the rails, especially the, if two of your first three series are against Florida AM and Bethune Cookman, who are shaping up to be the two top teams in the East right now. And I think this Jackson State team is a, if I can put it this way, a, a very swack team. They are super athletic. We see that from a lot of teams, especially out west. They steal a lot of bases. They've got athletes on the defensive side of the ball in the outfield and, and, and elsewhere. The, the pitching can be suspect. Uh, you may have some guys at the top, and obviously Van Devender can never put together a start out of the gate like he looked four, five, six, even seven, eight tonight. Then you're talking about a legitimate Friday night arm. But when you start slow, you can't really afford that. Then, of course, we didn't get to see the Jackson State pen tonight. But SWAC teams tend to have those couple of guys at the top, maybe one guy out of the pen that's solid, and then it all falls off the rails. But this is, an, like I said, an athletic team, a team that can absolutely hit the ball. They may be a little streaky, but they can hit the ball. Yeah. And they're a team that, that never, never quits. The SWAC, it, you can say whatever you want about the league as a whole, but there's some persistent baseball teams because some good coaching keeps guys accountable, persistent baseball teams. Well, if, you, if you're looking at pitching stats, right, the team ERA for Jackson State is a solid 575, right? And again, competition, make it what you will. But there's not a guy out of the pen that stands out as being – a liability you've got a couple of guys with maybe mid nines in in the era but you know you got four five one you know and, and i don't think this is a team that is as starter dependent as maybe they were last year when the wildcats ate up on their bullpen multiple times including in the swag tournament i think you see that particularly when you look at the walks to strikeouts you know 166 strikeouts to 131 walks not not a fantastic number you'd like to get that ratio a little better if you're jackson state but it's not a team like we've seen so many times this year in like Alabama A&M and some others who walk so many guys. And, you know, you can look at the hit-by-pitch numbers, too. They've got 48 of them. It's not a great number, but it's manageable. You know, it's it's not the end of the world. Like you said, they're not they're not just 
just depending on the guy to come out to start. They have some arms back there. We'll see the rest of them this weekend. It's not going to all end up like this tonight, but I think the key to the rest of the series for the Wildcats is going to be their starting pitching. We are going to hear shortly from Bethune-Cookman head coach Johnny Hernandez here on the Cat Eye Network postgame show. Once again, your Wildcats pick up the win tonight. Bethune-Cookman six runs on 